again for the reading of God's Word. Avery, are we good? Okay. As Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard the crowds going by, he asked what was happening. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. He called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. When he came near, Jesus asked him, What do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see, he replied. Jesus said to him, Receive your sight, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God. When all the people saw it, they also praised God. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> so I read this week uh, that there was a, a report that came out by the Barna Research Group. You may be familiar with them. They do research and statistics primarily about the church and religion in general, but mostly about the Christian churches. And they came out with something that I thought was disturbing. And uh, what it was, they asked professing Christians, had they heard of the Great Commission, and do they know what it means? Well, 6% of the people said they weren't sure. 25% of the people said, yeah, I've heard of it, but I don't know what it means. 51% of the people said they've never heard of the Great Commission, which I, I find astounding. And that left the other 17%, essentially one in five, to say, yeah, I heard of the Great Commission and I know what it is. And, and the Great Commission, it's given to us at the end of the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 28. And Jesus says to the disciples, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. It was Jesus' last command to the disciples. Before he ascended into heaven, he told them, go out into the world, get off your duff and go, and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Share my gospel with the people. Make them into disciples. Baptize them as a symbol of their repentance and faith. And then teach them about my commands and teach them to be obedient. I'm not just your Savior, but I'm your Lord as well. You follow me in both act and deed and thought. And go forward and do this. And this is a call to every person in the church. The Great Commission is for all of us. We need to be going out into the world, not just sitting here in the church, but going out there, and that's where evangelism begins. And the reason I mention that is today's story really is about one man who is saved, but it can be taken into a much larger, broader context, which we'll look at it in both ways. But the reality is the entire world is spiritually blind. And there is no hope for any person except the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when that opportunity comes where repentance and faith is possible, the individual should be bold and take hold of that promise. And we should not be a stumbling block in any way to anyone who wants to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. And when one sinner comes to faith, you know from the prior passages that even all of heaven rejoices and we should rejoice too. And so I want to emphasize all those points today as we look at this and see this man who is a model of all the world. Now it begins out, it says in verse 35, as Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. Luke mentions Jericho because we are watching Jesus progress on his trip to Jerusalem. If you go all the way back to chapter 9, we're in chapter 18 now, so all the way back to chapter 9, I believe it was verse 51, it said Jesus was resolutely setting out for Jerusalem. And we followed him down. He left up near the Sea of Galilee, up near Bethsaida, and we came along the Sea of Galilee, coming down the River Jordan. And we read not long ago that he was between Galilee and Samaria. So you can see the progression of his travel. Some 130 miles from where he started to where he'll eventually get in Jerusalem. And when he's at Jericho, he's only about 15 miles away now. He's about a day's walk away from Jerusalem. 
And so Luke is recording that trip. There's a blind man sitting by the road begging. The man is blind. He has no hope. He can't hold a job. He can't do work. He can't do anything to support himself other than sit by the roadside and beg. His life is hopeless, helpless. There's nothing he can do. And this is not only his situation, but the situation of the entire world. The entire world may as well be sitting on the roadside, begging, pleading for help, because the entire world is spiritually blind. Yeah, they might look good. They might seem like they're doing good things. They might seem rich and famous or whatever it may be, but the reality is they are hopelessly lost apart from Christ. They may as well be blind because they can't see the truth, which is their sin is keeping them separated from a holy God. And if they would just ask for their eyes to be opened, they could, in fact, receive that same promise. The, the blindness is lifted and they get to know who the Lord really is. And so the first thing I want you to think about as we start into this passage is the spiritual blindness, not only of the world, but the spiritual blindness that you once had. Because you too were one time a hopeless sinner, spiritually blind to the world, rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ. It wasn't until you came to Him in saving faith, repentance and faith, that you actually had that veil lifted off. And so as we think about the world, and sometimes, frankly, we get frustrated with the world. The world is evil and we see it. But as the Lord said, as He hung on the cross, they don't know what they're doing. They frankly don't. They're the blind leading the blind. And so as we are taking the Gospel into the world, the first thing I want you to remember is we need to go out there as Jesus went in compassion and gentleness. It's not going to do any good just to beat the heck out of the people because they're sinners. They are. They are. But we need to be compassionate and gentle as we approach the people. You catch more flies with honey than you do vinegar. We can bring more people to Lord Jesus Christ if we reach out in compassion to them. And that's the first thing I want you to remember. So this man is sitting there and it says, when he heard the crowd going by, he asked them what was happening. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. He cried out, son of David, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. This man cries out for help. There's a couple of interesting parts of here. One, he knows who Jesus is already. All right? He doesn't say what's happening and they say Jesus is passing by and he says, who's Jesus? He doesn't say that. He knows who Jesus is. He's heard about Jesus. This is the end of Jesus' ministry. The three years are nearly over. Next week in the, or in, in two weeks as we get to the reading, but in a couple of days in the story, Jesus is going to enter Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. So we're getting very close to the end of the story. <clears throat> this man has heard of Jesus. Somebody told him at some point, somebody planted that seed. Did you hear that blind people were healed by Jesus? Did you hear that the infirmed were healed? Did you hear that demons were cast out? Have hope, man, sitting on the side of the road, blind and begging. There's a Savior out there somewhere who can save you. He was told. And I want that to be an encouragement to you. Don't think every time you tell somebody about Jesus, they're going to just spring up and say, oh great, I need to get saved. Right? They're not going to do that. But you're going to plant seeds. And somebody else is going to water it. And eventually God is going to make it grow. But this man knew who Jesus was. And he knew that Jesus was his only hope. And they said something to him that I think made him shudder. He had been sitting by that roadside for who knows how long. Not a hope in the world, praying that he would just get a meager handout. And they said, the Savior's passing by. He's passing you by. This man has one hope, and it is passing him by as he sits there on the side of the road. Probably never going to happen again. I mean... Jesus is not going to pass by Jericho again. We know that for a fact. 
And this man, I am sure, is suddenly gripped with fear and terror. If I don't do something right now, he is going to pass me by. And so that man jumps up and yells, Jesus, Son of David, which is a messianic title. Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. He says the same thing that the tax collector said in the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. If you remember that from a couple of weeks ago. The tax collector who came to the temple in his shame and sin looked down, stood afar, beat his breast, and said, have mercy on me. This blind man actually encompasses many of the things we read through chapter 18, and as you read back, you'll see that. But he has boldness. And that's something that every person must remember. There needs to be boldness. Not only on the part of the individual who needs to be saved, but on your part as well. If you are saved and you're going to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, you need to be bold and go out and do it. Don't be afraid of it. Don't hold back. Somebody did you the favor of sharing the gospel with you. You owe it to do the share the gospel with them. But more so than that, you need to be careful not to be a stumbling block to people as you share the gospel. It says here that people tried to stop him. Those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet. Heaven forbid we ever put a stumbling block in front of someone who wants to give their life to Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you, it's easy to do and it can be done innocently as well. There's different ways it can happen. One, you can just give them a false assurance. You don't have to go forward. You don't have to say the prayer. It's okay. You don't have to repent of your sin. Just, just accept Jesus as your Savior, and it'll all be okay. All right? Be careful of something like that, false assurances. Be careful of telling them they have to do something before they come to Jesus. Well, you know what? You should come to church, and you should give your life to Jesus, but before you do that, you need to get your life right. That is absolutely false gospel. You aren't going to get your life right until you get to Jesus. So don't ask them to check off a box or do something other than drop everything you have and go to the cross and say, Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. And as the man was received and got salvation, so will every sinner. We've got to be careful. I think sometimes we're our own worst enemies. So as you're out there sharing the good news, be encouraging to people. Whatever they've done, I had this, made this comment before, if you consider yourself to be the worst of sinners, you can never look down on somebody else. Right? If you really think about your sin, if you think about your life, you were a horrible, nasty, godless, sinful person. And that's the way God saw you. But He also saw what you will become in Him. And so don't ever have a higher, a greater, a holier-than-thou attitude or anything like that. Come to them and say, like Paul said, I was the chief of sinners. If Jesus saved me, He certainly can save you. Because I can tell you, I was a lot worse than you were. That's a good place to get yourself. That's a good place of humility, and it will help to bring people in. So there needs to be a sense of urgency. There needs to be a boldness. There needs to be a gentleness and a compassion. And the only thing I want you to point people to is Jesus. Don't talk about how great our church is. Don't talk about how nice your pastor is. Don't talk about our vacation Bible school or whatever it is. I want you to tell them Jesus is your answer. Whatever it is in your life, Jesus is the answer. Paul said, I preach Christ crucified, period. That's what we need to be talking about. Jesus saves. He's the one who took the sin of the world on himself. He's the one who died for our sin. He's the only way. Point people to Jesus, just as all of Scripture points to Jesus. As we read on in the story, it says, verse 40, Jesus stopped which is just the coolest phrase. You can just stop right there. Jesus stopped. Think about it. The, Jesus was passing the man by. This is the one thing that the man needed. He needed Jesus to stop. And I don't know why I'm so stuck on this little phrase, but it's fantastic because if Jesus didn't stop, this man is done for forever. And maybe I think about 
the day I got saved, Jesus stopped to take the time for me. When you got saved, Jesus stopped and took the time for you. That should blow your mind. The Creator of all the universe took the time out to receive you to Himself. I don't know if that's as exciting to you as it is to me, but it is hugely exciting to me. Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. When he came near, Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see. Jesus said to him, receive your sight, your faith has healed you. And this is the outcome of every encounter with Jesus where someone comes in repentance and faith, where someone comes in humility. You know, I talked about how this whole passage ties up what we've learned in chapter 18. If you go back to the beginning of chapter 18, it was the parable of the persistent widow. This man, in his boldness, is persistent. We see that lived out. I already talked about how he had the same prayer as the tax collector. He comes to Jesus like the little children, in humility, in pure faith. He cries out to Jesus, Son of David, which is a messianic title and also ties into Jesus' prediction that he would fulfill all the role of the Messiah. It's really cool as you look back that how this story wraps up chapter 18 very well. But the point is, this man goes to Jesus in his desire for his sight, and Jesus grants it. Jesus will not turn you away. If you come to him in faith, if you come to him to the cross, just as I, I, I pray every one of you ever has, he's not going to say, yeah, David, I appreciate that you came forward this morning, but... I know about this, that, and the other thing, and that thing you did a long time ago, and you're just not ready. So go get yourself straight and come back. Or he's going to say, you know what, David, I died on the, sin, on the cross for the sins of the world, but your sins are far worse. I, I can't take your sins upon myself. Or something, nothing stupid like that is going to happen. Jesus is going to take you, and then he's going to make you into a new person. The old has passed away and there's a new person. When you come to Jesus in repentance and faith, He will take you to Himself and He will clean you up. That's called sanctification. He's going to make you more holy as you mature in the faith. But there should be nothing to stop you from coming forward and there's nothing that will stop you from receiving salvation if you come to Jesus in faith. And that's the message for the world. You've got to come to Jesus in repentance and faith. Turn from your sin. Turn to the Savior. It's very simple. It's hard to do. We saw the rich young ruler just recently. He could not give up his possessions. He had a choice to make. I can follow my money or I can follow Jesus. I'm going to follow my money. I'm sticking with it. All right, so it's not always hard. And that's why we need to be encouraging to people. But the thing that I wanted you to, to latch on to as I, I, I get here is this idea of your identity in Christ. Right? When you come to Jesus and you give yourself to Him, the man got his sight back, but he also now became a new person, a new human being in Christ. When you come forward and give your life to Christ, the old has passed away and now there is something new. You are new in Christ. And there's that newness about you that you need to embrace and grow. When you give your life to Christ, and I've, I haven't mentioned Jerry Martin in a while, but for those of you who don't know Jerry Martin, he was my mentor when I first became a believer. He was an older, wiser man, and he used to tell me and some of the other men that our position in Christ is perfect, spotless, blameless, sinless, holy. When God looks at you as a saved individual, He sees His Son. The perfection of Jesus Christ. That is your position before God when you're saved. You're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. You're a new creation in Christ. Now we vary on earth in our condition 
from our position. Our position is perfect, our condition is not. But the day will come when we go into glory and we will be perfect as God sees us. But don't forget who you are in Christ. Jerry used to say to us, you are not your sin. That was one of the best encouragements he could have ever given me. That I am not my sin. So all this culminates in what it needs to culminate in. Verse 43. Immediately he received his sight following Jesus, praising God. When all the people saw it, they also praised God. What other reaction could there be? I mean, here's this man. He was blind on the side of the road, begging, trying to get a meager life going. He hears the that Jesus is passing by. He doesn't let Jesus pass him by. He shouts and screams, asks for forgiveness, asks for his sight. Jesus gives it to him. What else could you do but praise God at that point? And all the people who saw it praise God. Think about that. Every time somebody comes down this aisle to give their life to Christ, we all need to rejoice. I mean, there should just be a party about it. And up in heaven, you know that the angels are rejoicing. It tells us in Scripture. All the world rejoices when one sinner sinner comes to salvation. So don't forget the joy. Let the joy be a part of that vision. The joy in Christ. It's hard. All right. So it's been a long time since I've run a half marathon. This is many years ago, but uh, you can probably tell. But it was brutal trying to run those 13 miles. All right. But then when I saw the finish line, that joy that overcomes, it's the same way with our work in the world for the Lord. It's not easy all the time. It's not easy, but we do it anyway because we keep our eyes on the goal. As Paul said, I press on toward the goal. And hopefully we're bringing others with us. And when you get to that finish line, man, that's the time for rejoicing. So don't ever forget about that. Let the church be known for joy. The joy that comes only through salvation in Jesus Christ. So as I wrap up, let me just remind you of a couple of things I want you to remember. First of all, in your witnessing, be compassionate, be gentle. The people out there are lost. They need Jesus, and you're not going to push them away You need to bring them near. Be persistent. As the sinner needs to be persistent in his desire for Christ, we need to be persistent in prayer. Just pray that the Lord would put somebody in in, in in your path today that you could share the good news. We need to be persistent in prayer and persistent in our evangelism. We need to point people only to Christ. Don't get tied up. The other night, I had some people over, the neighbors over, and this one man just out of the blue sat down with me, started asking me all kinds of theological stuff. Boom, 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 boom. I didn't ask first. He started asking me. He knew I was a pastor. And I tried to bring him back to Christ. All that other stuff doesn't matter. All right. He was asking me, you know, oh, if if the guy, the African Bushman who never heard about Jesus, does he go to heaven and that kind of thing? Or, you know, if a baby dies, does it go to heaven? And, you know, baptism. We talked about all kinds of just different things. And I said to him, that's all well and good, but what about you? You've heard about Jesus. Have you made the decision? Let's not worry about the African Bushman right now. Put the mask on yourself and then put the mask on the other person, right, when they, when they come down in the airplane. Point people to Christ. Find your identity in Christ. Who you are is in Christ. You are not your sin. You're going to fall. You're going to stumble. The Scripture says, though a righteous man falls seven times, he gets up again. I had that one on my refrigerator when I first became a believer. The day I got saved, I thought, this is great. I will never sin again. (laughs) I can laugh now. Boy, that was an awakening. And I had to remind myself by God's Word that although I fall daily, a righteous man gets up again. Don't forget that. Don't forget who you are in Christ. 
And then finally, everything I've asked you to do, be compassionate, be gentle, be persistent, point people to Christ, find your identity in Christ. All of those things culminate in praise to God. Everything we do culminates in praise to God. And if nothing else, before you lay down your head tonight, just say, God, thank you for everything you've done for me today. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. We do the invitation every Sunday because I never want Jesus to pass by anyone. There's always got to be that opportunity, and I'm always going to be persistent, and I'm always going to be bold, and I'm always going to ask you, if you have not given your life to Christ, come forward this morning. Terry's going to come up here and lead us in the invitational hymn, and I'm going to stand down here And I know there are people out here who are not saved. And I don't mean that critically. I mean that with a heart of compassion. I sat in the church for 39 years thinking I was saved, and I was not. And then I came to the realization by God's grace that all that I was doing to earn my salvation was filthy rags, as it says in Isaiah. Everything that I thought was to my merit was to my loss. The only way that I could save myself, that's, that sounds wrong, the only way I could be saved was to turn my life over to Christ. And when the pastor made the call, if there's anybody out there who needs Jesus in your life, I sat in the back of the church and I cried. Because I knew I needed Jesus in my life and I was afraid to go down. And by God's grace, He kept calling, and I saw people go down, and the Holy Spirit eventually got me up out of the seat. There was a lady who was sitting behind me. She said, Hallelujah. And I'm pretty sure she was probably praying for me. And I went forward and knelt down, and one of the elders came over and laid his hands on my shoulders. He asked me if I knew Jesus, and I said, I think so, which really meant I didn't at that point. (laughs) And he prayed over me, and as he prayed, Every sin I had ever committed, I could feel it drop off. It was the most remarkable feeling I ever had the day of my salvation. And that was what? 15, 16 years ago. 16 years ago, praise God. You can have that today. If you've never given your life to Christ, if you're not sure, let's make it sure. Jeff Greenway, who was one of the, the, the deacons a couple of years ago, we used to joke, measure twice and cut once, right? <laughs> if you're not sure, measure twice. Come on back. We'll, we'll, if you're saved, you're saved. If you're not, we're going to be sure. Don't let Jesus pass you by. This is that opportunity. Today's your day to give your heart to the Lord. Now, if you've already given your heart to the Lord and you know you're confident in your salvation and you have something on your heart that you want to share with me or you want me to pray over, please come forward and let me know. I'll be happy to do that. And then for those of you who would like to be members of this church, you're welcome to come forward and make that intention known as well. But first and foremost, I pray that the Lord sends someone forward to give their life to Christ today. Terry, can you please come forward to lead us? Our invitational hymn is hymn number 389, Spirit of the Living God, Fall Fresh on Me. Spirit of the Living God, Fall Fresh on Me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Melt me, mold me, fill me, use me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. 
soul of heaven, heart of God, wash over me. Soul of heaven, heart of God, wash over me. Cleanse me, teach me, hold me, reach me. Soul of heaven, heart of God, wash over me. Holy presence, love divine, cast out my fear. Holy presence, love divine, cast out my fear. Shield me, free me, call me, lead me. Holy presence, Love divine, cast out my fear. Amen. Before I dismiss you, let me remind all the church members, if you would please remain uh, for the meeting, the quarterly business meeting. It will only take about 25 minutes. We should be out of here by 1230. But if you can remain, please remain if you're one of the church members to be sure we have a quorum. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, I thank you for this wonderful day, and I thank you for the salvation through your Son, Jesus Christ, in whom we uh, turn forth in salvation. Lord God and Father, bless these people. Again, Lord, give them boldness and persistency to share the good news of Jesus Christ, that many more may come into the kingdom of God. In your name, and the Son, Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.